Hello, and thank you for joining the POCUS Academy for today's POCUS Bytes webinar. I'm Maddie, and I'll be your facilitator today. We are now starting, so all lines have been muted. Please use the chat box or the question submission box for any comments or questions that you have throughout the webinar. I would like to invite you to our next webinar in the POCUS Bite series on May 21st, discussing point of care ultrasound use in MSK ultrasound of the shoulder with a focus on the rotator interval with Mark Schmitz from Savano Skills. Register today on our POCUS.org website to save your spot. Our speaker today is Peter Bonadona, a veteran paramedic having 42 years in metropolitan and rural EMS experience. In addition to a field practice, he directed and taught in the Monroe Community College paramedic program for 30 years. A pioneer of sorts, Peter was the first provider to put a computer in the ambulance for medical records and one of the originators of using cell phones for telemetry and medical control. Despite objections, he continued to teach paramedics to read and interpret 12 lead ECGs for two years before the equipment was available to acquire them in the ambulance. Today, Peter is doing the exact same thing with point of care ultrasound. He has an ultrasound machine in the classroom and teaches anatomy and physiology with the device so that students can actually see what they're learning. Peter recognizes that point of care ultrasound is transformative and could, can substantially improve the care we deliver in the pre-hospital and hospital environment. Today, Peter will prove to you that POCUS can be incredibly useful for EMS, benefiting both the patient and the paramedic providers, and we are thrilled to have Peter with us. Peter, thank you for being here. Thanks, Maddie. Thank you for having me. My pleasure. So uh, I've been involved with training paramedics and working with EMS for 42 years. And uh, one of the greatest honors I've had was to serve as the paramedic program director for Monroe Community College. And uh, in that time, my last 10 years of that program, we added point of care ultrasound to the curriculum so that the students had ultrasound machines readily available to them for practice, as well as uh, when we were teaching them anatomy and physiology, we would often pull out the ultrasound machine and take a look at the structures that we were learning about. So uh, I frequently travel around the country now in my uh, semi-retired years, uh, teaching at various paramedic programs that want to add point-of-care ultrasound um, philosophies to their curriculum. And I've also been involved in helping many EMS agencies add point-of-care ultrasound to their, their ambulances and their helicopters. Um, it's interesting to note that back in January of 2009, the national standard paramedic curricula had actually added point-of-care ultrasound to the curriculum way back then. Uh, and the authors of this document were very forward-thinking. When you look through this document, you'll see some modern additions to the paramedic curriculum that are listed maybe once or twice. Uh, but when you go through this document, you'll see that uh, point-of-care ultrasound is actually listed in it uh, four or five times, uh, which led me to believe they were really forward-thinking and uh, understood how powerful this technology could be for the pre-hospital providers. Uh, unfortunately, uh, many paramedic programs, even the accredited ones, uh, have glanced over these uh, requirements and standards because the paramedic program uh, instructors simply didn't have the means to teach it. They didn't have the equipment or even the knowledge about how point-of-care ultrasound could be used in an ambulance. So I hope today uh, to inspire some of these paramedic program instructors to seek out training and uh, contact the people that are doing it so that they can add this very valuable technology to their curriculum. Uh, already within the paramedic curriculum, is much of the material needed to have a great understanding of point of care ultrasound. Uh, you know, we teach pretty in-depth anatomy and body planes. Um, we already, as a group of paramedics, view a screen and interpret what we see in terms of electrocardiograms and that sort of thing. And the science and physics preparation, uh, if they don't already get it within their pre-course work, it certainly can be added to the um, general lectures uh, in the paramedic program so that they can understand the science and physics needed to understand point-of-care ultrasound. And in addition, um, 
when you learn about point to care ultrasound, it opens up a whole uh, cadre of uh, emergencies that the paramedic could now identify and disease processes that the curriculum normally doesn't cover because it would be nearly impossible to identify these emergencies without ultrasound. So the addition of this technology to the classroom and to the field actually broadens the differential diagnosis and allows the paramedic to hone in on a more accurate diagnosis. Uh, <clears throat> you might hear that some people say that this isn't really within the skill set of a paramedic. Uh, I disagree. I think, again, in addition to having you know, a lot of anatomy and physiology and the science necessary to understand it, studies show that even eighth graders can uh, technically learn and perform point-to-care ultrasound. But what was even remarkable uh, that the authors found in this study is that these kids went on to teach their, their classmates how to do it. And the students that were taught by the previous class were as skilled and talented and knowledgeable as the first group. So this is a technology that, while I don't necessarily always believe in the see one, do one, teach one, um, it's certainly this technology uh, lends itself to this. Um, educationally, uh, point to care ultrasound can really uh, help the paramedic student and the paramedic in the field because in the classroom, the students were actually able to see real anatomy. They were able to see it in real time. They were able to see the function of this anatomy on classmates and themselves. They could see the high variability within the human body. You know, when you just look at a textbook that's a Gray's book or a Netter book, um, that really just gives you the idea that the inside of the human body is all the same. But uh, the beauty of looking at 10 different students is that we can see the size relationships and the locations of organs, which I find to be very valuable. Uh, being able to see these organs also reinforces to the student that they should learn their anatomy very well because they're going to be able to look at it in the next five minutes. Um, again, students can appreciate the great variability of human anatomy. Um, I often find even paramedic instructors, if I were to ask them if they could point to my spleen, they would often be at, off in the wrong location by about six inches. But after a little practice with ultrasound and looking at a few spleens, for instance, most paramedics have a general sense of where you would find a spleen. And this is really important in terms of looking for injury and you know, where there is an impact on the body and so forth. Um, and, you know, point to care ultrasound is fun. It helps maintain the attention of the students. You know, we're living in an age where these students you know, don't just read books anymore. They watch videos. They, they like to be involved in the, the learning experience. And by having hands on with pointed care ultrasound, this ramps up their excitement and they get to uh, retain the knowledge much longer because of the excitement and the fun that it causes when they're learning it. So, <clears throat> one of the interesting things that I found about um, studying point of care ultrasound is that even if the paramedics um, practice in a system that doesn't have point of care ultrasound, they will be better providers if the ultrasound training occurs in their original program. And what I mean by this is that, um, for instance, I learned along the way that when a patient has a classic uh, presentation of kidney stones, for instance, that the differential there could also be a dilated aorta that's now pressing on the ureter and blocking the urine outflow of that kidney, giving the patient the very same symptoms of a kidney stone. And so by knowing that, if I have a patient now that I haven't been able to look at uh, with an ultrasound and I drop them off to an emergency room and perhaps the triage nurse wants that patient to go into the waiting room, if the patient has risk factors for a triple A, I would be more inclined to say, you know, we need to have the doc look at this patient quickly to make sure that a triple A doesn't also exist here. So <clears throat> even if people don't have the ultrasound equipment in their ambulance yet, having the knowledge base behind what the internal anatomy is and what it can malfunction to uh, can actually be a real benefit to the providers. Um, clinically, uh, there's no question being able to see inside the body will allow for more accurate assessments. Um, you know, we've been taught as paramedics that, you know, when someone bleeds into their abdomen, that the abdomen will become very uh, rock hard and, and will be very painful. And <clears throat> while that's true in about 10 to 20 percent of the time, it um, is often completely absent when patients have internal bleeding. 
And so having the tool to look inside to see if they are bleeding is incredibly powerful and can help us catch patients uh, that don't have these outward signs. Um, trending of the internal environment of the patient's anatomy is important. For instance, if a patient has an injury that has very slow bleeding, the initial scan may be negative, but if these scans were repeated every 10 or 15 minutes, we would be able to get a sense of the speed at which ongoing bleeding is occurring. And you know, we do that with the 12 lead EKG today. We might do an electrocardiogram on a patient with chest discomfort, and the first one is negative, but then within 10 minutes, we would repeat this and find if anything is cropping up over that time period. Um, there's no question that uh, we would have better skills delivery. Uh, point of care ultrasound is uh, useful in things like starting IVs, uh, making sure that <clears throat> the chest wall is the proper thickness for the needle we're going to use if we're going to do a thoracentesis uh, uh, or any other procedure where we're guiding needles into the body. And then um, better triage, having a sense that the patient is sicker than we might have thought can help us up triage them to a more um, appropriate facility. Um, there are new technical challenges for the paramedic. You know, we have uh, patients now that have left ventricular assist devices and total mechanical hearts that are starting to uh, become uh, prevalent in our communities living at homes. And uh, when they have emergencies that crop up, they present some really interesting challenges. For instance, in patients with LVADs uh, who are very dependent on the device, their heart doesn't produce enough of a pulsation to give us a, uh, the ability to measure their blood pressure. They have more continuous flow in their arteries than pulsatile flow. Uh, point of care ultrasound is excellent for that. You see two students here on the right actually learning how to assess blood pressure by using point of care ultrasound, which will be very accurate in those scenarios. Um, there are new classes of medication being added to the um, environment and the, the community all the time. Some of these medications uh, will actually cause spleens to enlarge and spontaneously rupture. And again, without having a tool to pick up these uh, you know, uh, complications, it's just gonna leave us flying in the, in the dark as paramedics. Um, and now that there are more specialized treatment centers around, I think if the paramedics have the ability to pick up these uh, finer uh, diagnoses, they're going to get them to the right center uh, more accurately. And today there are patients that are home that are sicker. They have, you know, we have more congestive heart failure patients than ever at home, more patients that have you know, mul multiple stents in their heart. Uh, and so the acuity of the patients that we see today are sicker than they've ever been. Um, this is a kind of an interesting little picture. This shows you some of the uh, uh, fun that some of the paramedics had with uh, point of care ultrasound, you know, but they're also doing some critical thinking here. Here we have a paramedic student who was wondering if his pet tortoise was uh, pregnant, and uh, he knew that ultrasound could answer this question. And so here he is kind of skating the ultrasound probe through, through into the soft tissue between the opening of the shell uh, looking for eggs. And uh, this also opens up a, a conversation with the students, you know, how do we sterilize these probes afterwards to make sure we don't transmit infection between patients to patient. But uh, students were really uh, very uh, forward thinking and, and involved a lot of critical thinking when it came to ultrasound when it was added to the curriculum. Um, in terms of professional improvement for the paramedic and ET profession, um, it certainly allows for better communication between healthcare professionals. You know, if a, a paramedic uh, brings in a patient and tells the doc that there's fluid in Morrison's pouch, uh, that paramedic is, is perceived to be, you know, much more knowledgeable about the patient's care, and they share a common uh, language in how to, you know, treat and examine patients. Um, better care would immediately be recognized by other healthcare providers and by the community. And I believe that the paramedic self-esteem would improve when their accuracy improves. Paramedics are, are pretty accurate in their ability to make the right <clears throat> call and the right diagnosis, um, but it's not 100%. And uh, it's always nice to be able to add a technology that will help them increase their sensitivity and specificity when they're trying to figure out what's wrong with the patient. 
Um, there are lots of interesting future directions for the pre-hospital environment. Um, the equipment now is becoming much more uh, common, more ubiquitous. It is, uh, you know, certainly uh, its quality and durability will improve as they, somebody looks at the EMS market and realizes that there's, you know, 800,000 ambulances in the United States that don't have ultrasound in them. And so whoever captures that market really stands to have a great uh, profit margin. So I encourage companies that are able to make good devices for us to start looking at that market. Um, connectivity to experts will improve with the uh, 5G networks that are, are coming. We can stream this data very quickly to the experts, whether they be our emergency room physicians or radiologists or cardiologists, and have immediate feedback uh, and quality assurance. And then, of course, uh, AI and automatic interpretation, you know, artificial intelligence uh, is rapidly improving the ability of these machines to give us accurate and uh, useful measurements that can help us take care of patients. And so I think it's a really exciting future. Um, <clears throat> and one that isn't even listed in my presentation, but uh, is really exciting for me is the uh, prospects of sonolysis. Sonolysis is the use of a standard ultrasound machine uh, to put out ultrasound energy to dissolve blood clots. And uh, in, in this role, we could use this to dissolve um, blood clots of myocardial infarction and heart attacks or strokes. And there's emerging evidence that this is very useful and maybe the future in how ambulances take care of heart attacks and strokes. Instead of giving them blood thinners to dissolve these clots, we may be able to use mechanical energy of ultrasound to dissolve them. So very exciting in the future. But if our paramedics aren't all already prepared to do ultrasound uh, and understand how it works and understand what to look at, I think it would really slow us down in, in the delivery of future technologies. Um, so uh, I find ultrasound will be an excellent tool in any paramedic classroom uh, and certainly should be added to all EMS uh, agencies that deliver care to emergency patients. It really is the wave of the future. Thank you, Peter. That was really great. Very interesting. And we actually have a number of questions that have come in. Um, it looks like we have about 22, no, I'm sorry, 12 minutes left in our webinar. So I think we can get through a number of these questions. Um, but thank you so much. That was very interesting and uh, very exciting. I think that there's some really exciting things coming down the future for um, POCUS use in in uh, EMS, so thank you. The first question that came in is, how accurate is POCUS in the hands of emergency doctors with limited sonography training? And then there's kind of a second part to that, sorry. Um, they said, any faults, negatives or positives? Yeah, that's a great question. You know, with any test that we give a healthcare <clears throat> professional, it's uh, there. There's always going to be false positives and false negatives. There's there's no perfect test out there, and the way that we try to deal with this is that uh, when we give these folks training, the understanding is is that they should seek out the, the the best training that they can get, and then practice as much as they can under the guidance of another skilled sonographer. Uh, whether it be an emergency physician, whether it be a radiologist, whether it be a, a formally trained sonographer, um, and get as much experience as, as possible. And then also within their training, we try to include all of the, the pitfalls that could happen that we've learned through the ages that can cause us to make the wrong conclusion. But in the way that point of care ultrasound is used, the, the, uh, we're not making very complicated uh, decisions using you know, incredibly precise measurements. You know, we're, we're basically just looking for, is there free fluid in a thorax? Is there um, a big stone wedged in the neck of a gallbladder? Things like that, which um, most uh, experts would agree are fairly simple to deduce and very simple to interpret. So while there's always um, a margin of error in anything that we do in medicine, uh, in the way that point of care ultrasound is being rolled out both in the emergency room and in the pre-hospital setting, uh, it's, it's set up in such a way that it's, it's very safe and 
tends to improve our sensitivities and specificities. Um, when you look at physical exam alone, a history and physical exam, we're seeing numbers like 70% accurate. When you add point of care ultrasound to it, we see numbers like 95%, 98. So in just about every study I've ever read, point of care ultrasound helps us improve our accuracy. And there's no question that's gonna be better for our patients. I agree, um, and thank you. I think that that, that was a great question that came in, um, and I think that that's a, a really great way of looking at it. The next question that has come in is um, really wonderful, and I think it pertains exactly to what you're talking about. Um, you know, people want to have fun in the classroom. People want to be learning and expanding their their expertise. And the question is, how can I initiate and or implement an ultrasound program or ultrasound use in my EMA? EMS system? That's a great question, and there are several different ways you can do this. The, the first is that all uh, EMS agencies uh, across the U.S. have a medical director, and the physician medical director would be the first place that I would start. Uh, asking your medical director if they felt this would be good for the patients in the community and if they felt the providers were up to speed in being able to deliver this technology. Um, and uh, if they can convince their medical director, uh, next step would be to learn as much as they, they can about uh, ultrasound. And I found that the, uh, while it's not a good uh, choice to learn a lot of medicine on the internet, what I have found is that on YouTube, there's a fair number of highly uh, uh, well done uh, point of care ultrasound videos by healthcare professionals across the country. And there's just so much information there that's uh, available for you to watch and learn. And so a big part of their education can come from the uh, FOMED uh, EMS medical community. Um, after that, if they're still struggling to try to incorporate it, they can always look me up on the internet and I can try to work with them. Um, I, I like to travel all over the place and help folks get trained and get started with this. Um, and there are other agencies now popping up that can help EMSers uh, come up to speed with ultrasound. Thank you. The next question I think tags right into this one. Um, it was just submitted and it's how long or how much time should someone put into learning POCUS in order for them to be considered qualified to perform POCUS? That's a, that's a great question too. Um, it depends on the exam type that you're looking to use. For instance, the, the beauty of point of care ultrasound is that um, there are unique little exams for specific uh, purposes. For instance, if a paramedic wanted to learn how to see if a lung is collapsed, um, it may only take four hours of, of lecture and training to do that um, and, and to be able to do it fairly well when they leave the classroom. With that said, they want to get as much practice as they can after that and to make sure that their, their work is being surveilled by somebody who's qualified to make sure that they're doing it properly. But there's a wide range of physical exams that can be done with point of care ultrasound, now numbering in the, you know, probably 100 these days. And so for someone to be technically competent in all of those would take, you know, many, many, many hours. But once again, point of care ultrasound can be tailored to what are the needs of a particular individual or EMS agency. And what I'm finding is that four to six hours of initial training for any specialty, such as let's say they want to learn how to use the ultrasound to start IVs under ultrasound guidance. Again, six hours there of training, lots of practice before they roll it out to the patients. Uh, and they can become quite competent in a short period of time. Uh, so I would always approach it in a stepwise fashion, learn the exams that you need to learn, become very good at them, uh, and then gradually move on to other skills. Thank you. Um, right along those same lines uh, and thinking about like the skills and the specific types of learning that somebody should have to be able to use POCUS in their field, uh, this person asked, what clinical questions should be addressed by an EMS using POCUS? Um, I think most uh, EMS medical directors agree that when it's used, it really should be used for things like um, 
uh, looking for lung slide to detect pneumothorax. The, the stethoscope is pretty inaccurate uh, for that uh, particular exam and has a high error rate. And uh, point of care ultrasound has a 100% negative predictive value. Uh, if it says the lung is up and not collapsed, it's, it's very good uh, evidence that the patient does not have a collapsed lung. And uh, that can prevent some accidental procedures, such as a needle thoracostomy, uh, where paramedics would put a needle in the patient's chest, perhaps in error. Um, we, we do that now based on physical exam, but we know that we could be wrong 25% of the time. And so by adding that for a lung exam, I think that would be really valuable. I think it could also be used in cardiac arrest with proper training for them to make decisions about the cause of cardiac arrest and the activity of the heart, which can help us in our decision making uh, in the delivery of advanced cardiac life support. And other exams such as the FAST exam or looking at the IVC for fluid tolerance would all be incredibly powerful to the practicing paramedic. Um, a quick lung exam could also tell us whether the lungs are wet from pulmonary edema versus emphysema. So, uh, you know, there's a, there's a list of 10 or so initial exams that would be perfect for, for paramedics depending on their need. Thank you. Uh, we have about four minutes left and it looks like there's one more question that has come in. So if there's any kind of hesitant questioners out there, please be sure to submit your final questions now. Um, and then we will also be able to, if we don't get to your questions, we will be able to email you because each of your questions is attached to your email address and name. So we'll be able to email and follow up with you. Um, but the last question that has come in so far is when is there potential for harm, governance, SOPs? Um, and I'm gonna just kind of leave that with you, Peter. Uh, I think that uh, with close medical supervision, we can uh, negate any, any concerns along those lines. But it, it is true that if uh, a group of EMSers were just turned loose with this technology without supervision from their medical director, um, it could be, you know, incorrect decisions could be made. They, they might uh, try to say that the patient isn't as sick uh, because the ultrasound was negative and they might take the patient to a, a closer, less prepared hospital. Um, I think that they could be enthralled with the technology and spend too much time at the scene, uh, further delaying the patient's care. Uh, but, you know, smart medical directors are already aware of the, the concerns here. And, uh, you know, in most systems starting out, they mount the ultrasound in the ambulance and, and the ultrasound exam would only be done on the way to the hospital so that the patient's care wouldn't be delayed. And as physicians gain more confidence in, in the paramedic's ability to use it and to use it correctly, then we could see these devices become more portable and leave the ambulance where exams could be in a, in a car accident or in the patient's home. Um, so. You know, obviously we don't want long delays uh, at the scene and uh, that has to be incorporated into the protocols on how it's going to be used. Uh, there has to be a good infection control uh, program where we're taking one device that we touch every patient with. So the ultrasound probe becomes a fomite for infection. And so again, we have to create barriers that prevent the blood and infectious material from touching the ultrasound probe and have methods to make sure that we clean and, and uh, you know, render any pathogens harmless between uses of the uh, probe from patient to patient. But again, all of those things are commonly done in medicine. They're commonly done in the emergency room. And so with the guidance of the medical director, all of these things would be added into the curriculum. Great. We have received one last question. I think, I don't know if we can answer it really quickly, um, but has POCUS been approved or codified by CD10 codes for reimbursement purposes? Is there any sort of support on that side for POCUS and EMS? It does, it is, as a matter of fact. I know that emergency rooms, when they do point of care ultrasound, uh, they bill for it. And uh, if you meet the requirements of the insurance company, uh, EMS could also bill for the ultrasound exams. Now there, there are many things that have to be in place. There has to be formal training, formal supervision, 
there usually has to be an expert involved in the reading of the ultrasound within you know, a period of time. All these images would then have to be saved for review later in the event that the insurance company wants to see that the exam was actually done. Um, but yes, there, there are mechanisms whereby um, they can get some financial reimbursement. Uh, but that's really a counter to the point of care ultrasound movement, whereas we're using these like stethoscopes and nobody would ever think about sending the patient a bill for putting their stethoscope down on the patient. And uh, seeing how we're using point of care ultrasound like a stethoscope, I think you're going to see many agencies just uh, you know, write the expense off as a way to improve patient care. Great. Thank you, Peter. We are at time, um, but we really appreciate you being here today and taking so many of our questions. This was absolutely phenomenal. For those of you who are, have participated, there is going to be a recording of this web webinar available on the pocus.org website in a couple of days, and you will get an email reminder letting you know that that recording is available. Feel free to share that recording with your colleagues. For more POCUS talks, Please check out our Focus on POCUS podcasts, our POCUS blogs, and of course, follow us on social media where we post regular POCUS clinical challenges and keep you updated on the newest POCUS exciting things. Thank you all for attending our webinar today, and we look forward to having you join us for our next webinar in May. Thank you, Peter. <laughs>